Hey everyone, welcome to the Bucket Courses. Um, it's, I'm Joanne Bundy, and I chair the Community Education Council, which probably brings you the Bucket Courses. We're happy to have you here this morning. This is the last course that we have uh, in the spring 2017 season before the Bucket Courses uh, takes a break during the summertime. Of course, we'll have the ACES classes at that time, so you can still kind of stay into the Wednesday morning habit. We're happy to have you here this morning, um, and if you will silence your cell phones and uh, turn on the tea coil, we will get right into our class this morning. Uh, many of you may uh, have heard of Joy Rosenfield. I'm sure if you have any connection with the college, you have. Uh, and you know that he's an illustrious alum but you may not know exactly what it is he did or how he did it. And who better to tell us about that than another illustrious alum, George Drake. George, uh, too, is a college graduate of Grinnell College. Uh, he's a professor of history at the college, um, and he's serving the Board of Trustees, and he has been the president of the college. He is in a unique position to know Joe Rosenfield and understand what he has done for the college. I know that you are always happy when I say, and here is Professor George Drake. Thank you very much, Joanne. And can, are you hearing back there? Eric's got the thumbs up, okay. And Dave, oh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to. Uh, start by not talking about Joe Rosenfield. It's a sort of point of personal privilege, but also one in which the, our uh, planning committee has fully concurred. I want to uh, recognize the gentleman right up here, Burrow Klopfelder and his wife, Mary Lou. For this re there are many reasons why you could recognize Burrow. Most of you probably don't know it, though, of those of us that the college do. The current curriculum we have at Grinnell, the so-called open curriculum at the time labeled no requirements, was Burrell's idea. And he's the one that put a proposal out before the faculty that eventually was adopted. And not only, I mean, it's important because it was done at a very interesting time in, in American higher education history, but it stuck. Almost every college that moved in that direction has retreated. Grinnell College has not. So this curriculum, which began in 1970, we're still doing it. It's, it's, it's amazing, and we need to, I mean, so those of us at the college honor Burrow, we just, as we were having a conversation, Burrow said, you know, I've been retired just as many years as I, as I taught at the college. <laughs> um, and in his retirement, he taught bucket courses. Not only did he teach bucket courses, he taught the very first bucket course, uh, over at the community college at Iowa, at Iowa Valley. Uh, and his topic was um, the, our universe, how do we know? I think it was actually six lectures, wasn't it? Eight, eight lectures. Imagine that, eight lectures. It was terrific. Uh, and really opened our eyes, a terrific PowerPoint presentation and so on. And uh, uh, here he is, and, and Mary Lou, Mary Lou was his his sounding board. Uh, what might people understand? What might they not understand? But, and for those of us, the lay people who were there present, and it was very understandable. And, and, and anyway, it was just a wonderful lecture. And he did many other lectures for us. He got to the point where he said, no, I'd rather come and just listen and not uh, be up there doing it. But Burrow, we have this little uh, memento for you, which is the bucket stuffer from that course. <laughs> Okay, now to the subject at hand, Joe Rosenfield, and the reason that I have the temerity to do this is that um, about three years ago, I was commissioned to write a biography of Joe. Uh, and I have to say that it, these things are never straightforward. Uh, it was, it, it, the idea came from our development office, the folks who raised the money. 
And uh, they were beginning to realize that since Joe's death in the year 2000, our connections with Des Moines had loosened. Uh, in the research I've done, you go back to Joe's time and before Joe's time, half the board were from Des Moines. And they often, the, the, the uh, executive committee would meet monthly and always in Des Moines. Uh, now there are one, maybe two active trustees from Des Moines on the board. So what better to re-cement the connection between Des Moines and Grinnell than a project focused on Joe Rosenfield. So that was the idea they had. And then there's a person out there who feels he owes all of his business success to Joe. And that's Jim County of Des Moines, now currently a developer and developed in the East Village in Des Moines. But at the time that he got to know Joe, he was the one, one of two partners creating Heritage Communication and Cable to the, and we'll get into that story later uh, this morning. So that's how this came about. You might ask uh, what's happened over the last three years, and I've been plugging away and have written, and as Judy Hunter knows well, she's my editor, uh, the, largely the sections on Joe and Grinnell College. And I'm working now on Joe and Des Moines and his family. And it's interesting that it's very difficult to find out very much about Joe's family. By the time I knew Joe, he was a widower. His son had been killed in an auto accident. He never referred either to his wife or to his son, ever. And the people I'm interviewing, and I've done 25 to 30 interviews, um, are at, at the oldest ones are a generation below Joe. And even the ones who knew him intimately said they, they could tell me almost nothing about his family relationship. And that's in, an important part of the psych psychology of Joe Rosenfeld, which we also will get into. I want to start right now by having a show of hands out there, people who met Joe or sort of knew him, have had a direct impression of the man. And I know there'll be quite a, I'm seeing a lot of them in the back, but I'm seeing close to 15 hands. Uh, Emily, <laughs> and I, I'm going to ask you, uh, just very briefly, if anyone has a, you know, a st so standout memory of your encounter with Joe, would you uh, say something about it? And I will retreat, re repeat the essence of it from up here. But does anyone uh, have a memory of Joe that you, I mean, what was the impression you had of this man? You know, I mean, you probably didn't have extended conversations with him, but uh, some of you may have had. All right, Carol. I didn't know him, but I know that he was an avid Chicago Cubs fan. Aha! <laughs> that was actually uh, Carol's uh, comment, which I will repeat here in a minute, is, is related to something I was going to say almost at the beginning. So I'll say it right now. In October of 2016, a baseball team called the Chicago Cubs won the World Series. Uh, why was that notable? For us Cubs fans, it was quite notable. But for anyone who followed sports, this was the longest drought of any major professional team from one championship to the next. One, uh, the year 1908 was the last Cubs World Series championship. As Jack Brickhouse, uh, the television broadcaster for the Cubs used to say, any team can have a bad century. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly the Cubs did. Uh, Joe Rosenfield was the, in the, back in the days of the Wrigley's. The Cubs, there were 10,000 shares of Cubs stock. The Wrigley's owned 8,000 of them, and the rest were sprinkled around to people like me. I once owned one of those shares of Cubs stock. Joe Rosenfield had 274 shares of stock. He was the principal minority stockholder of the Chicago Cubs until the, the uh, Chicago Tribune bought them and all of us had to sell our stock. We had a Cubs room on the campus. Also, I called Joe's when I was president and I called him and I said, Joe, we have to sell our stock, I know that. And I also pretty much guessed, I said, I know you'll give that money to the to the college, why don't we create a Cubs room on campus? So this 
non-athletic liberal arts college out in the cornfields of Iowa had a room dedicated to a professional baseball team in Chicago Cubs. We had Ernie Banks out for the dedication. Some of you may have known Jack Cullum. Uh, Jack Cullum was a major league pitcher, pitched for Cincinnati and for St. Louis. And, and Jack, Jack Cullum came to the dedication. He was a sort of a dumpy old guy at that point. And Ernie, it was a, one of the most brilliant moments on our campus. Ernie Banks looked out to, and he said, there's Jack Cullum. I could never hit that guy. <laughs> and Jackie Cullum is, it just, it just glowed. It, it, was a, it, was a, it was a wonderful moment. Okay, so Chicago Cubs. And the reason I was going to start with that is Joe used to say, I'll never see them win a championship. And he didn't. And the first thing I thought of after that seventh game against Cleveland, in Cleveland, was Joe. Uh, I don't know if he knows, but it was a, would have been a wonderful thing for him. Okay, Chicago, any, any other uh, things you remember a comment about uh, Dorothy? I had a chance to thank him after the development of the Rosenfield Scholarships, which of course you worked with him on. And uh, in order to promote applications in the Des Moines area, we had lost a lot of interest from East High, uh, Lincoln High, some of those schools. So he made a tremendous difference in reestablishing interest of, of Des Moines students in Grinnell College. Very, very good. Uh, Dorothy, who actually had was close to the situation because she was, we hired Dorothy as a recruiter for Iowa students. When I became as president at Grinnell, we had more students from the New York metropolitan area than we had from Iowa. We were about 9% Iowa. And we were struggling at missions, frankly, and Dorothy can certainly remember that, a lot of us can. We were, we, we were in trouble. It seemed to me and others that one place we should be able to affect is our own state. And so we hired Dorothy, who did nothing but Iowa recruiting, and we got up to 18%. Uh, through, through Dorothy's efforts. It was a tremendous thing that she accomplished. And you say, why is that a big deal? Well, there were high schools. You mentioned East, Marshalltown, that wouldn't let a Grinnell person in to the high school, go through the doors. It was too corrupt in this college. Uh, wow. image, image of, in Iowa. I, I, as president, went around and met with principals and, and uh, counselors in high, in high schools, particularly in the Des Moines area. And Joe stepped forward, and this is what Dorothy commented on, and created some scholarships for, particularly for Des Moines students. Anything like that that needed doing, Joe was right there to do. And it was tremendously helpful. Any other comments? Maybe one or two more, and then we'll, I'll start <coughs> by when I'm prepared. Any other comments that people have? I'm sure, I mean, it was, I was pretty sure that we would have 15 to 20 hands. Because, <laughs> partly because we're old enough. <laughs> to have known Joe, but uh, if you had any connection with the college, uh, oftentimes you had some opportunity to meet Joe. Emily. Uh, Joe would uh, occasionally, uh, uh, after a trustee's meeting, come with some other trustees to, to our house to talk sports with my husband, <laughs> but also to talk about other things. And, and, uh, so, I, I feel like I really, I felt like I really knew him as a person. I'm sure you did. Amazingly uh, gentle, uh, charismatic. Uh, both, uh, Emily said, both gentle and charismatic. Uh, she, the, what, what she described was the, the fact that, I mean, I'll begin by saying Joe was exceedingly interested in sports, as, you know, witnesses in the Chicago Cubs. Maybe you'd question whether they were part of sports at that time. <laughs> um, and he, he, he said that on several occasions, I never missed a sporting event at Grinnell College. I used to go out and watch practices. He was not himself an athlete. He played tennis and was a decent tennis player. But uh, he spent a, he, I've got one at, at Babbitt, he and, and some of his friends from Langen, took off and went to Columbia, Missouri to see the Grinnell, Missouri football game. And we'll get into that next, next week Next week when I talk, talk about Joe at Grinnell College. But Grinnell was in the, the uh, Missouri Valley Conference with all these major universities. 
and uh, he was interested enough to go off to see uh, on a way foot, football game. And uh, Joe would come sometimes after board meetings uh, to the pitch home with John as our athletic director. And, uh, they talk sports, uh, particularly in, on those occasions. Uh, I think this may be the time. I'm, I'm doing all kinds of stuff that I hadn't been intended to. Joanne and I were talking before, and she said, well, uh, anyway, I was saying, I'm not, I think I've got enough time for everything, and then I do things like this. <laughs> <laughs> you saw it in the paper with Emily's honorary degree at the college. Yeah. And yes. a number of us were involved in that, and. Uh, it, it's honoring Emily, but it's also honoring all those Grinnell College spouses who did so much for our students and their colleagues. So, Emily. All right, I'm going to read to you something. Um, and I, I thought of uh, making this part of the handout, but I decided not to because it's the forward to my book, <laughs> and, uh, and, <laughs> always floating around. It, it's written by Warren Buffett. And he, here's what he said. Many years ago, a reporter from the Des Moines Register interviewed me for a story about Joe Rosenfield. I told him I loved Joe and could talk almost endlessly about why that was so. The reporter smiled and said my reaction was exactly what he was receiving from all he had contacted. I will just stop for a moment. One of the problems with this biography is it's very hard to find anyone who has anything negative to say about Joe. It's going to be a hate geography, I'm afraid, and, and, which is not a very good biography. So anyway, um, young and old, female and male, CEOs and household help, you name it. What he particularly had been struck by was how frequently the word love was used in describing Joe. If true wealth is measured by how many people love you, not a bad yardstick, Joe would have ranked number one on the Forbes 400 list. <laughs> Joe was wise, humorous, generous, friendly, public-spirited, possessing all of these qualities to an extraordinary degree. But most of all, he was interested in you, whether a presidential hopeful planning campaign strategies or a confused student contemplating his or her future person seeking Joe's wisdom received his full attention. And what wisdom that inquiring person would receive? Joe's knowledge covered all bases, but his truly invaluable insight centered on his understanding of <coughs> human behavior. I could spend an hour describing some seemingly intractable problem I was encountering with a difficult person or a business situation. Then presto, Joe would deliver a sentence or two that provided a simple, an effective solution to my problem. And I, I will just insert that Warren and Joe would talk almost weekly by, uh, by phone. Joe never asked for anything in return. He was not a fellow who kept score. The great friends never do. I knew, however, that there was one act of mine that would delight him. He wanted very much for me to become involved with Grinnell and focus on its finances. And, of course, I wanted equally as much to please Joe. I would never be able to balance the books in terms of what we did for each other, but I could, at least, try. So I joined the board simply because Joe loved the school and I loved Joe. Joe sponsored my appointment to the finance committee at the college and thus began many years of fun. At 86, I can't recall any committee assignment in my lifetime which, in which I experienced such pleasure. When Joe would call me at night to discuss some action that would swell Grinnell's coffers, his enthusiasm was that of a kid in a candy shop. I couldn't help but share it. So we conspired to have the college buy convertible debentures in a startup, Intel, shorted securities in a can't-lose arbitrage, AT&T, made a leverage buyout of a network television station, WDTN in Dayton, and the list goes on. The more outrageous the act might seem for a college endowment, the better Joe and I liked it. Every, every investment move was always entertaining for us and always, well, almost always, profitable. In fact, we truly had more fun making money for the college than we did in making good investments for ourselves. 
All of this took place because Joe loved the Grinnell students as he loved members of his family. They were his flock. And his interest did not diminish in any way after their graduation. He regularly filled me in on what the graduates were accomplishing, describing them with the words and tone of a proud grandfather. You will read in this book the story of an important institution that has helped many thousands of young men and women proceed to a better life than they thought possible. You will read the school's journey from survival to excellence. It is a story that could not have been written without a lifetime love affair between Joe Rosenfield and Grinnell. Warren Buffett, February uh, 2017 in Omaha, Nebraska. So that, that, in a way, I could just stop right there. <laughs> that, that's, that's Joe. What I'm uh, planning to do is uh, today, we won't actually aren't going to talk about Grinnell. We're going to talk about Joe Rosenfield, his family, uh, we'll look at the chronology in a few minutes. Uh, his association with Yon the Yonkers department store, uh, stores and other non-Grinnell activities and contributions. <coughs> then next week, I'll focus on Joe's time as a student at Grinnell, 1921 to 1925. And we'll, I have to say that this book and our my lectures will be as much about the college as they are about Joe. And Grinnell was an in, very, at a near, very interesting point in the 20s. Uh, John Hanson Thomas Maine, I, say, I almost say that, John Hanson Thomas Maine, <laughs> six foot five. Uh, I'll never forget my first year as president. And uh, when, oh, it was during the alumni reunion I went and, went, and the alumni, alumni college, and I went over and had lunch with some of the folks at the Quad and sat down with them. And, these were graduates from the, from the 20s and 30s. And I uh, said, who are you? And I told them I was the new president. And the look of shock on their faces <laughs> blew me away. I, at least I knew enough about the college. I knew what was going on in their minds. This twerp is in the shoes of John Hanson Thomas Mann. <laughs> They couldn't, they couldn't get their minds around me fulfilling that particular, that, that particular role because he was that sort of person. Maine became president in 1906, died in office in 1931, had been the dean uh, of the college and a classics professor before that. Uh, and most of our good colleges, or best colleges, like Grinnell, had a very important and long presidency in the early part of the 20th century. And our college was up at Carleton, I was at Colorado College before we came to Grinnell, a man named Slocum. Pretty much, I know there was someone at Oberlin, I can't remember the name right now, but it, it was pretty common. And these both people left a, a large imprint. Physically, Maine left those dormitory complexes to us. They're, they're the most iconic, in my view, buildings at the college. So he was president during Joe's time, and there will be some references to Maine in, 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 as we talk about Joe's time at the college. But it was a very interesting place. It was not uh, as the quality it is today. Joe has very little to say about the faculty, and he was a pretty indifferent student. Uh, but it was the experience of being with other people at the college, other Grinnellians, and the experience of that campus. And we'll, I'll talk about that. Because what was it that caused Joe to love to follow? I mean, uh, his, his uh, godson, Fred Little, who's a trustee, been the chair of the trustee, said, Joe had a pathological love for Grinnell. He describes him almost a pathology. So what happened in those years that caused Joe to feel that? So we'll talk about that next time. And then the last two, we'll talk about Joe as trustee. He became a trustee about a week and a half before Pearl Harbor. So he had quite a ride. Uh, and was a trustee until his death. And, uh, you know, at the last few years, he couldn't get over to the college for the board meeting, but people went to him. And, so he, and his mind was unaffected, so he had a lot, he had a lot to do in right up to his death. 59 years as a trustee of, of, of the North College. So seven presidents, so the majority of the presidents of the college were, worked with Joe. And very different individuals, and he had very different relationships with them. The president that those of us from the 50s remember, uh, Sam Stevens, 
Joe resigned from the board. There were six months in there when Joe wasn't on the board. He resigned over Sam. Uh, it's an interesting story that, that we'll talk about uh, in, in the, the beginning of the third lecture. So uh, let's let's turn to the chronology, which you have in, in this handout. Here you are, me, me in front of you, no tech George. Um, but I do give you handouts. So you can take something with you. And let's let's look at the at just at the simple chronology here. So he's born in, in 1904 in May of that year. And his mother is Rose Franklin Rosenfield, and his father is Myle Rosenfield. And we'll, I'll get into those two people very definitely, and particularly Rose. Well, when I describe her, you, I think you would agree with me. You could write a biography about Rose. She was that important and, and powerful person. His high school was West Des Moines, no longer, and Roosevelt sort of replaced West. Uh, and he graduated in 21, came to Grinnell meeting uh, the following fall, and graduated in 25, so made normal progress, and then law, immediately law school at the University of Iowa, three years of that, uh, and he graduates. Then he goes into law practice immediately in Des Moines at the Gamble Reed and Howland, later Gamble Reed, Howland and Rosenfield firm, where he worked full time as a lawyer from 1928 to 1927. This is, in terms of my research, this is one of the big blanks. I've been to talk to people at that law firm, but because law firms don't let you look at their archives. And he, he did, did corporate law, essentially. He was the Yonkers lawyer during that period. So Yonkers was a big account. And you can sort of see why they might have hired him, because Joe was from the Yonkers, the family that owned Yonkers. So a good person to hire, and maybe you can get that account. And they did it. And then, uh, successively went after Joe left the firm, they still had, had the account. Um, he, mar he married in 1940 to Danny Burke from uh, uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. She died in 1977. She, Joe said at one point, you know, when he asked why were you a Democrat, he said, well, Danny was a Democrat. She actually influenced him quite a bit toward being a, a strong supporter of the Democratic Party. And then she was a regent of the Iowa University. So she was, in her own right, a, a quite a substantial person. They have a son, James, born in 46 and died in an auto accident in 62. The newspaper article I was able to find about this, it was, it was his VW bug that had the accident, but he wasn't driving. Another, another student was driving. It was in his uh, final, he, was at, he went to Lincoln High, High School at that time that Rosenfields lived in that part of town. Yonker Brothers, and I'm going to talk this morning quite a bit about Yonkers, the result of the merger of four Jewish family department stores. Uh, and uh, Joe, uh, his uncle uh, Henry, was president of Yonkers for many, many years. Joe, in 47, when he left the law firm, became vice president. There's a very interesting story of a, uh, the second or so day that Joe was there, and they were interviewing a candidate for a job, and the candidate said, uh, well, what are your prospects for advancement at Yonkers? And Joe said, well, I've been here a day, and I'm already vice president. <laughs> <laughs> it was typical Joe. Joe was known as, when he was a student, as Lina Day Rosenfeld. <laughs> uh, he always had a quip. Um, and, he, and then in 48, he became chairman of the board. He'd been on the board since 29 when his father died. He took over his father's position on the board, so just after getting out of law school, he becomes a board member of Yonkers, uh, and then had a roughly a 20-year run as chair of the board, and then when he retired, they, and Yonkers had a mandatory retirement age, uh, then they created an executive committee of the board and put Joe as his chairman so he could at least have some contact with the stores, and as I get into the Yonkers story, you can see why Joe was important to them. So Grinnell College Board of Trustees, I've already said that he began in November of 41, and you can see the list of presidents there that, uh, uh, that he served with, or he served over. The growth of the Grinnell Endowment. Joe used to say that at his first meeting, when he looked at the endowment, he said it was about $78,000. Now, when, you, when we turn the page here, look at the growth of the endowment, you see it's listed about a million dollars. 
But in those days, the dormitories were part of the endowment. They counted. So the value, the, the physical value of those buildings were part included in the endowment. On the assumption that they were revenue producing. Well, anyone who's managed the college knows they are not. They, they produce revenue, but then there's expense on the other side. You spend more on them than you get back. So they, they were a weak, very weak form of the endowment. And Joe immediately recognized that until this college um, developed an endowment, a substantial endowment, its prospects of survival were very good. And when we get in, in those third and fourth lectures, uh, you'll see, I'm going to tell a story of hand-to-mouth existence. Hand -to -mouth. When Joanne and Carol and Sue and some of you in the room were students in the 50s, I've since joked, uh, MJ, I've since joked that if the college was ever going to die, it was when we were students. It, be t it was true. Yeah. At that time, the college, the banks were refusing to loan to the college. Mm -hmm. It was no longer a good enough risk. Uh, and we'll, we'll get into the arrival of Howard Bowen or the ways in which Howard Bowen, in many ways, Howard's may be the most important presidency in the college's history. Because the college, just, it just becomes a new place with Howard. So, um, anyway, that, that, and let's, let's turn over to the next page and you'll see there the, the, the growth of the endowment market value. And uh, it tells its own story and it's, this is the description, this is the the um, numerical description of what Warren Buffett was talking about, what he and Joe did. Warren be became a trustee in 68, and you can begin to see that acceleration around that time. And of course, Joe dies in 2000, and he, he, the endowment keeps on going gangbusters. Uh, once you get a lot of money, and you get into very good uh, market situations, and some Right, there, there are six administrators, the people in the treasurer's office today, who do nothing but manage and document, I mean, track the endowment and so on. Three of them are in Des Moines and three of them here on campus. So, um, you know, the college is, it has advisors no longer, I mean, it's a, it's a terrible idea for the board to do its own investment. A terrible idea, except if you have Joe Rosenfield and Warren Buffett. <laughs> and, uh, so it, it worked for us, but most, it, it goes, it's counter, as the norms of uh, managing endowment. And we're, we're managing it more normally now. Uh, so there's, the, there's that particular story, plus a statement about the uh, dorms being pulled out in, in 1970. I am beholding the page Carlson of our uh, treasurer's office for that uh, list of things. I think, well, we'll, you can see their photos and so on, otherwise here we'll, we'll I have reference to those, but I think that uh, takes us through the, through the end and uh, chronology. All right, something about the family. And we've probably got about five minutes or so more, Joanne, to, to talk about this. Meyer Rosenfield, father, uh, came from Rock Island, Illinois area, and he married into uh, this pretty well, by the time of the marriage, a pretty wealthy family, the Franklin family, Rosenfield. And uh, his interest was mostly business. Uh, some of you knew Louise now, and many of you know that she wrote uh, an autobiography, Journey to, a, to Autonomy, which is more or less the story of Rose and her uh, love-hate affair with her mother, uh, of, of Louise and, and Rose's relationship. And the, the autonomy is when she gets out from under Rose's uh, strong hand. And uh, Louise describes her father as someone who never wanted to leave home. Uh, and, you know, came home for lunch, but back, back to work, back to work. And, and Rose was a traveler. Meyer didn't want to travel. Uh, it's very hard to sort of dope out the, the, the influence of, of Joe's father because the mother's influence was so overpowering. So Rose, um, for example, every single middle name of her children was Frankel. <laughs> Joseph Frankel, Rose, Rosenfield, Ruth Frankel Rosenfield, Louise Frankel Rosenfield. Uh, she's very proud of, of, her, of her family. She was the daughter of Isaiah and Babette, uh, who were both German immigrants in the 1850s, this massive wave of German immigration after 1848. 
uh, that did so much particularly to people the, the Midwest and Iowa in particular. They ended up in Oskaloosa, Iowa, where Isaiah became, was a peddler, kind of a typical European Jewish commercial activity, but within the American context, it morphed into a small department store in, in Oskaloosa. So by 1861, they have a, a store in, Os in Oskaloosa. There were four sons and two daughters, and Rose was the elder of the two daughters. All four sons went into the clothing business so that, uh, uh, with, with their father, and then one is going to be sent off to Des Moines to establish a branch store in Des Moines. And when I, when I tell the story of the, of the assemblage of Yonkers, it's a sort of small town, eastern Iowa beginning. The Yonkers began in Keokuk. And then the railroad goes to Des Moines in 1866. Oh, Des Moines might be an interesting place, and it begins to grow. And it, by the time when they uh, established those stores in Des Moines, it was smaller than, say, Cuba was. But uh, they, rec they recognize that maybe the future might be up in, up in Des Moines. So that's how, how Yonkers moved from these smaller towns uh, to be centered in Des Moines. All right, so Rose. Uh, just, I'm going to give you just a list, and then I think we can, we can break right, right after that list. Uh, in, she was philanthropic and tremendously civic-oriented and civic-spirited. In 1905, she went off to Chicago to meet with Jane Addams to talk about creating a settlement house in Des Moines. Jane connected her with a person, an up-and-coming young woman named Flora Dunlop, and, and Rose set her up in Des Moines, Flora up in Des Moines, and they created the Roadside Settlement in Des Moines. So, uh, first settlement house in Des Moines was Rose, uh, Rose's creation. She founded the Des Moines Garden Club, and she had at, at their house on 37th Street a, a sort of show place of garden. She was founded the first parent teacher association in Des Moines at West High School. Ran the women's division of the World War I bond drive in Des Moines. So there's the philanthropy. She was the first head of the women's division of the community chest of Des Moines, which is the precursor to the United Way. Charter member of the Des Moines Planning and Zoning Commission. And she had a lot of trouble with that, a bunch of men. In fact, Dean Darling, when he was head of, the, of that Planning and Zoning Commission, had a dinner party, uh, a meet, it was the night of their regular meeting, a dinner party at the Boyne Club. Rose wasn't invited. Rose went to where the meeting was supposed to be, and no one's there. She was incensed, as you, as you can imagine. She was a charter member of the Des Moines Park Board. She endowed, now we get close to Goodell, she endowed the annual lectureship in foreign affairs at Goodell College in 1934 in honor of her husband, Meyer. Uh, the, those of us who were students in the 50s remember the Lose Rosenfield lectureships, an annual lectureship in international affairs. The Rosenfield program, which we now are, are so aware of, in uh, Human Rights and International Affairs is an outgrowth of that, which Joe ended up in, in order to continue that particular interest. He had an interest of his mother. Um, the library at their home on 37th Street, sets of Shakespeare and Dickens, Jane Austen, and the interesting thing uh, is magazines and newspapers. She subscribed to Foreign Affairs. And that's a quarterly academic uh, international relations magazine. The Nation, than which there is no more liberal magazine. The New Republic, right on the liberal side, Atlantic, Harper's, and the weekly Manchester Guardian, which is the Guardian today. I mean, imagine growing up in a home back in the teens of the last century with that kind of reading material around. I begin to see why Joe was the way he was in, in, in many ways. I mean, that mother's influence was just extraordinary and, and uh, had a huge, huge impact uh, on Joe. Um, I'm, I, I'll just, this will take maybe one or two minutes here. The, the, man, the family moved from the Sherman Hill area to 37th Street, which is south, the south of Grand Area. And uh, Babette, the grandmother, by this, by this time Isaiah's uh, 
dead, moved next door. So Joe grows up right next door, and she was a remarkable, remarkable woman. Back, back in Germany, she made her living at, 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 in a millinery shop where she would take the products out to people in the countryside and walk, you know, 10, 15 miles a day taking these things, things around. So she wrote her autobiography, which is a really very interesting story. Their uncle Henry, uh, president of Yonkers, lives a block away. Gardner Coles, publisher of the Moyne Register, was across the street. The, the, the Frankel uh, private tennis court, the one that they had in their yard, was the, the center of neighborhood activity until Coles built a better one. <laughs> Louise comments about that. Everyone migrated across the street to, to, to the Coles estate. Uh, it was a Tudor house, and they had servants. They had a cook, a housemaid, a gardener, and a chauffeur that they shared with Babette. So uh, there, well, uh, Joe grew up in a very well-to-do family, which really gives you a sharp contrast. Joe was determined to die uh, insolvent, which he didn't. His, his, uh, he gave everything, everything away. So I, I think, uh, oh, and I could just say, add, add that um, Joe moved in, after, after he got out of law school, he moved back home. He lived at home for a while, which wasn't all that unusual then, but really a, a huge family oriented, yet if you ever talk to Joe, you never heard anything about family. It's really interesting, that particular contrast. And then finally I'll say, Louise said, all, about, all Louise has to say in the, in the autobiography, there, there are a few things where they, she and Joe cooperated on some venture. But uh, she constantly says about Joe, he was the favorite. <laughs> and. Uh, she says, for example, as young adults, my brother was offered monetary reward for not smoking, while my sister and I were offered only our parents' disapproval. <laughs> <laughs> Louise wrote, it's, it's a very well-written book. She really is a smart woman. And because Joe would always say, ah, oh, it's Louise. <laughs> they were so different. All right, let's take, let's take a break. Well, I did, just during the break, Forrest was asking me about these uh, families that, that made Yonkers. I'm, I'm going to, that's exactly where I'm going to start at this point. Um, the Yonker brothers, again, German immigrants of the 1850, early 1850s, started a uh, peddler business and department store in Keokuk, Iowa in 1856. 
And by 1874, they had opened a branch store in Des Moines. And the Mandelbaum family started a store in Des Moines in 1899. And in 1923, Yonkers and Mandelbaum, Mandelbaum came together. And there were family members from both sides that were part of the uh, executive structure of Yonkers. The Frankels uh, started their store in 1861 in Oskaloosa, and by 1901 had opened a branch store in Des Moines. Very shortly after that, another store, Harris Emery, uh, founded by these two families, actually, so it actually makes more like five families, uh, and Yonkers uh, negotiated a merger. In, uh, shortly after 1901. So, but the name Harris Emery was the one that the general department store used. There was a Frankel's clothing store, men's clothing store in Des Moines, but uh, that's part of the family too, but then the, the major share of their business is gonna be under the Harris Emery name. Then in 1927, Harris Emery and Yonkers, Mandelbaum, Frankel, uh, merge into one single department store. That's the Yonkers that we knew uh, from 1927 forward. Interestingly enough, Yonkers was by, in sales and in profits the larger of the two. But uh, they man the Franco side managed to negotiate a 50-50% share of the voting stock. And as uh, Norman Wilczynski, who was the president of Yonkers at that time, said, they want to make a buck just as badly as we do. So, uh, as when asked, why on earth did you make it a 50-50 uh, uh, matter with respect to the control of the store? Um, so, you now have this larger store that um, Joe, in, in two, two years later, will become a uh, direct one of the directors of, and then uh, roughly 20 years later, will actually join as a vice president, and then from 49 to 69, chairman of the board. Now, what was Joe's role with Yonkers once he started full-time with it? It was not in retail. He never put himself forward as anyone who know, knew anything particularly about retail. What Joe knew about was property and investments. And uh, this, you see, this is 47, 49, right after World War II. A new phenomenon is emerging on the American retail scene. Shopping centers. Places where you can go and park. A place that will have room for a thousand or two thousand cars to park. Yonkers downtown had to finance a parking garage near Yonkers uh, in order to survive downtown. So Joe this is typical of Joe. He recognizes that this is the way for the future. And this is what brings about the uh, close association of Joe Rosenfield and the Bucks Bombs. General growth, developers of shopping centers. What do shopping centers need? They need an anchor store. Wouldn't Yonkers be a great anchor for our shopping center? So that's what Joe was involved with, was the expansion of Yonkers. There's a wonderful story about Merle Hay. Um, Merle, the property on which Merle Hay Shopping Center was developed was owned by a Franciscan order of the Catholic Church. And they were, they were anxious not to be so close to major urban development, and so they were interested in selling. And uh, so Joe was the one who was making, doing the property negotiation to get that property so they could uh, have a store and eventually a mall uh, it, what we now call Merle Hay. And the negotiations weren't going very well. And uh, the last time that Joe met with the head of the order, the order said, you know, Mr. Rosenfield, we've been around for 2,000 years. We can wait to get our price. <laughs> and as they got in the car, uh, Joe and a guy named Bill Friedman, uh, and I've interviewed Bill, and Bill told the story. Joe, Joe said, Bill said, well, what are we going to do, Joe? And Joe, Joe said, ah, 
go ahead and pay him. <laughs> so that's once when, once when Joe was out, out, out maneuvered. But I guess if you're going to negotiate with the Catholic Church, you better keep that in, that in mind. They can, they can wait a lot, lot longer than, than you can wait. Um, so, you know, Joe's intimately associated with Merle Hay. Duck Creek in Bentendorf. I don't know if any of you uh, know, know that uh, store. That, that was in 1960. Merle Hay was 59. They bought Davidson's department store in Sioux City, a major department store in Sioux City, and that was 48. Joe was involved with that. But from 1960 on, it was a, the, Joe was pretty much involved with the general growth shopping center developments. He, he liked, Joe, Joe had a, an uncanny ability to sense uh, talent among young people. Yeah, I'll have to say young men mostly, although Joe was not definite, definitely not a sexist, but it tended in that era to be young men. And he thought that uh, uh, Martin and Matthew Buxbaum were really very interesting people. They started out in the department, in the, in the grocery store business in Cedar Rapids. And then at a certain point when they were trying to negotiate for uh, another building and so on, they got into the idea of, well, maybe shopping centers, maybe that's the thing we should be doing, not the grocery business. So they, shift, they shifted out of the grocery business into the shopping center business and became enormously successful uh, in, in, that, in, in those developments. And a, a key connection was the Yonkers connection. And Joe, when he retired from Yonkers, moved his office to General Growth. That's where, when I knew Joe, that's where his office was, in, in the General Growth area. And I, I didn't know enough about the history to know why that was the case, but that really, that is what, 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 what was the case. Um, then the other side is that Yonkers was really quite profitable in this era, very profitable. And they had a lot of money to invest. Guess who would do the investing for Yonkers? Joe Rosen. And, and I'll tell a little bit more about that story when we get to the, her to the heritage communications. So those were the things that Joe did. Uh, property uh, negotiations as they're enlarging into um, these branch stores. Uh, uh, and it's, it's interesting, I think, what year was it? Um, it was about, I think it was about 67 or 68 before the the a collection of branch stores outsold the downtown store. And the downtown store was still really it. I, I'm going to ask for a show of hands. How many of you uh, did do, you know, at least some shopping in the downtown Yonkers store? Look at that. How many of you would go to the, you'd make it a day of it, and go to the tea room? Yeah. Uh, meet you at the tea room, you know? And you probably, uh, particularly the women, got dressed up pretty well. I mean, it was a day. Uh, and Yonkers was, they were geniuses at recognizing that and making it a day for you. I mean, there was lots, of, usually there were something interesting going on in Yonkers, some interesting person to meet. They brought them in lots, lots of uh, celebrities. Uh, they would have style shows. How, how many of you went to Yonkers style shows? And not quite as many, but still a lot. Uh, and they had their whole uh, sort of assemblage of models uh, for the style shows. They, uh, they had a college board. Uh, Peggy Lowe was uh, on the Yonkers college board. Uh, they were, uh, you know, Des Moines high school students or college, in this case college students from Des Moines, who would advise uh, gra recent graduates what to buy uh, at, at when they went off to college. And they represented Iowa State and Iowa and Grinnell and so on. Uh, they had a group of high school women and then eventually a group of high school men who were advisors within the high schools on uh, wardrobe and so on. Yonkers, they, they didn't miss a bet. They, 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 had, they published a monthly uh, magazine. And I've been through all of them. Uh, that, by the way, the, if you're interested in Yonkers, the material is at the Iowa Historical Society, the Yonkers Archive. It's a very extensive archive. And um, you see, you see a, a family there, employees, 
20 years, 30 years, 40 years. Uh, in 1945, they created a retirement program, uh, to which 10% of pre-tax profits were contributed. So from 45 on, if you worked for the office five years or more, you had a company finance retirement program. Uh, they also had a weekly news sheet. And you go through those particularly, you see, particularly during the war, pushing war bonds, pushing war bonds. Uh, Yonkers would close the store on an election day till 10 o'clock or so, so their employees could be sure to vote. And in, in these monthly magazines and in the news sheets, vote, vote, vote. School board election today. Everybody should vote. Uh, I mean, the, lo the most local of elections, where it's really hard to get, you know, people like Carol who sit at the polls, and it's pretty lonely on uh, uh, the school board election, or uh, maybe even the city council election sometimes. But Yonkers was full bore on citizenship. And there would be articles on citizenship. Now, granted, there were a lot of articles on serving the customer. And, but they were the best sort of articles. Of, uh, really, it, they, they had seminars, they had lots of articles you could read about what it is to put the customer first. Yonkers had a no questions asked return policy. Uh, it, I mean, it, it, if, you, if you immerse yourself, as I've been doing this, uh, this last few months in this Yonkers material, you realize this is an extraordinary organization. And uh, I, what's, you know, the light bulb goes on. Maybe this had some impact on Joe Rosenfield. Citizenship, philanthropy, responsibility. Uh, it, it's, it's there. It, in the family and in the organization uh, for which he worked and which he was a part of. So it, 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 it's, uh, this is, you know, th there have been revelations in this research, but this the Yonker material was to me a real revelation. To me, it was just a story. Uh, and actually, in 1968, they sell to Equitable of Iowa, and these families are out of it. What's going on? Uh, the best I can determine is they realize in the environment that's developing in the 70s, they no longer will be able to continue as they have been continuing. They probably would be bought out. Let's pick an Iowa, a responsible Iowa group to sell to. So they do. But equitable struggles with, uh, with, with that, and, and they soon sell. Uh, the downtown store closes in 2005. Uh, and by 2006, Yonk has become part of a big chain, Carson Perry Scott, Herbert, Boston store chain. Hundreds and hundreds of stores. And, and it's really interesting to see the change in the, in the uh, monthly uh, magazine. It becomes a four. It was a 25-page magazine in the heyday. All sorts of stories about employees and what they were accomplishing and so on. Everybody got in there, I think. Uh, it wasn't just the big executives. It was the people on the floor and so on. But, and and the, the sales pitches are the best kind of sales pitches, which focus on that. If you have satisfied customers, we all benefit. And how do you satisfy customers? This is the approach. And there would be cartoons about the wrong approach and, and the right approach and so on. So the education of their employees, I, I regard as the best sort of education. But you get into this later period, it's all of theft, both by store employees and by customers. Uh, hard sell advice. Sales, sales, sales. I mean, it's just... It just disappeared. I mean, it, it, you can see it's a different sort of enterprise. And uh, so, you know, and of course, in a way, today, you can't, and hardly blame them. Brick and mortar stores, how are you going to survive? And you've got to cut costs, cut costs. How do you survive with all of that you know, inventory that you've got in order to have some sort of advantage over the online operators? And, and you've got to cut staff, cut staff, cut staff, so we go into Yonkers and can you find anyone to serve you, that sort of thing. Whereas back in the heyday, you did find people to serve you. And I, I was just so impressed when you, all these hands went up about how important Yonkers was to your life, to, the, to that particular part of your life. And it wasn't, I, I would say, am I right about this? It wasn't a bad experience to go in there. It was an enjoyable experience. 
And it wasn't just shopping, it was so a social event, it was entertainment to, to a degree. Uh, and it was dealing with, with uh, staff who cared about you and served you well. So that doesn't happen easily or overnight. It happened deliberately. Uh, and you, and if, by looking at the, you just if you have a chance sometimes, just look at one of those, called the Anchors Reporter, just one of those magazines, and you'll see uh, what I'm talking about. So anyway, that's Joe and Yonkers, and it's an important part of the story. Uh, even when I worked with Joe, I sort of knew he was had been involved with Yonkers, but anyone, and they, they would ask me, what's Joe's connection with Yonkers? And I would just say, I don't know, it's some connection. <coughs> Uh, we've got Yonkers Hall. I lived in North Yonker for four years. I'm a North Yonker man. That was important back in those days. I have a hall pin, my North Yonker hall pin, and so on. Uh, I was, you know, I was beaten brutally in order to earn the privilege of being a North Yonker man. My butt was stinging after every Monday night hall meeting, and so on, because these guys broke paddles over it. Um, so, but. No, you know, young, and this is Joe, and I, you know, run across the, well, the that particular negotiation, but it was Yonker money that went into the Yonker. So that was what I mostly knew, sort of casually, about Joe and Yonkers. But it's a great story, and I'm I'm really happy to be uh, finding it. I found it. So other aspects of Joe's non-Grinnell life, and I think I can go over these quickly enough to leave maybe leave five minutes or so for questions and, and uh, general decompression from, from this. Um, we've already talked about the Chicago Cubs, so we don't need to say more about that. Planned Parenthood of Iowa, uh, or now is, it, is Planned Parenthood of the Heartland, which includes Nebraska. Joe was the principal contributor, private contributor to Planned Parenthood. Uh, it's a wonderful story that that Warren tells, Warren Buffett. He says, Joe called me one day and he said, Warren, I'm gonna put you in my will for $25,000. And uh, Warren said, what, what, what? <laughs> Joe says, there's only one stipulation. You have to give it all to Planned Parenthood. <laughs> and Planned Parenthood was left several million in Joe's will and he gave several million to it during his lifetime. I've interviewed Jill June, who ran the Iowa Planned Parenthood for a number of years. She probably knew Joe as intimately as anyone, because they spent a lot of time together, and uh, Joe would unwind with her. But even she couldn't say much about his wife or his son, about that immediate family. I asked her, uh, I had um, given, given some leads, and I asked her this question, did Joe pay for the abortions in Iowa? Or someone had said, Joe, pay, Joe financed most of the Iowa abortions. And she was very cagey about the way she said, let's just leave it, say this, we did not use public money for abortions. So we depended on private benefactors, and Joe was, of course, the major private benefactor. So yes, Joe, and he too surely knew what, what his money was going, some of his money was going for. And so, you know, if you want to say something that would cause a lot of people's hair to go on end about Joe, yeah, he financed abortions in Iowa. Living History Farms. Bill Murray was the person with the idea for the Living History Farms and was driving the process. Bill Murray uh, was defeated by Harold Hughes for governor of Iowa. <clears throat> And uh, Bill came to, after that election, when he, uh, Bill came to Joe and said, Joe, you owe me one. Would you help me with Living History Farms? And so Joe was a major contributor and driver for the creation of Living History Farms. Joe and the Democratic Party, he was one of the principal funders, particularly for Iowa Democrats. Um, it, it, that got him on Nixon's enemies list. Joe was inordinately proud of being when that, when that list was the New York Times or Washington Post or whatever found it. And there's Joe Rosenfield with Des Moines, Iowa on it. And Joe, was just, just, that just made Joe glow. <laughs> being on Nixon's enemies list. He was the principal funder for Harold Hughes. 
And the story of the folks who worked at General Growth is that Hughes was in Joe's office about weekly when he was governor. Uh, so uh, they knew each other well, they respected each other, and then, of course, Hughes became U.S. Senator in 68, he was governor of Iowa, 62 to 69, then you know, elected in 68 to the Senate, began in the, 60, the Senate in 69, then he was running for president, then run for president in 72, and Joe was obviously key to that. He would have been the principal uh, fundraiser for, for Harold Hughes' presidential run. And he was all on board with it until Harold started talking to his dead brother. And Harold uh, believed in mediums and so on, and uh, became fairly well known that he was doing, to this, doing this, and Joe and others began to back out. How's anyone going to be president of the United States? Maybe if your name's up, named Donald Trump, you might be able to pull it off. <laughs> but most normal politicians can't negotiate that sort of problem. So uh, that sort of killed because the, fun, the, the donors, the funders, were beginning to fall away. And it was a big disappointment to Joe that, uh, because he thought in every other respect Hughes would make a great president. And he was an extraordinary, I, I wasn't in Iowa when he was governor, but an extraordinary man, reformed alcoholic, truck driver, uh, person of the people for sure. And uh, you can see why Joe would have liked him so much. Joe was, uh, I've, I've, I've interviewed Tom Miller, I have yet to interview Culver, John Culver and Tom Harkin, but uh, what Tom Miller has told me is that Joe did a lot with, with the young John Culver, with Tom Harkin and so on, to get them financed and going in, in politics. So Joe made a huge difference to the Democratic Party in Iowa and the people he supported and to some of our better Democratic leaders. Um, one other thing I was going to say about politics, and it's, it's escaped me, so I will, I, I will let it escape, and uh, if it comes back, you'll, you'll hear, oh, I know, it has to do with John Ruin. Um, one of the remarkable things about Joe, I mean, think of, of course, it was a different political environment than today, but think of this. Some of Joe's closest friends were staunch Republican funders. John Ruin, for one. He and John was maybe his closest, you know, sort of peer friend. Joe's peer friend, eh? Johnny. I mean, I, I can remember having lunch with Joe. I, you know, as president of Des Moines of Cornell, you trundle over to Des Moines and have lunch with Joe at the Des Moines Club. He'd go and go into the office at General Grove in the morning, come to the Des Moines Club, have lunch, play gin rummy afterwards, and go home and watch the Cubs and take a nap. That was pretty much his routine when he got when it was older. And uh, I'd meet Johnny Ruan, and Johnny come on over to the table, and it's this sort of thing. I can see that close camaraderie. Well, Ruan was a just a died in the world Republican and financial Republican, and yet they interacted so well. And I, you don't find these, you know, Republicans, you know, hating Joe Rosenfeld or denigrating him just because he was a Democrat and a big pusher of Democratic causes. I was, I've been told that. In a way, we owe the world food prize to Joe. John Ruin funded it. But uh, Joe tipped John off about Intel. And Ruin invested heavily in Intel, and it's the Intel proceeds that went into the Iowa food prize. So Joe's indirectly connected to the, to the Iowa food prize. That's one of the reasons that Ruin liked to hang around Joe. He got awfully good tips. <laughs> He was rated by the Des Moines Register, I forget, it was probably, it was from the 80s, I think, as the number one philanthropist in Des Moines. In fact, I mean, there was a time, I remember, when the Register would do these things. Who's number one, and so on. He, was, he never rose about eighth in the business uh, listing, but uh, number one as a philanthropist. And he, and he, is, in, he is in the Iowa Business Hall of Fame. He went in pretty early. Uh, there are actually two members of the class of 1925, Grinnell class of 25, who were in the Business Hall of Fame, Joe and John Norris, um, you know, Lennox Furnace. So Joe and John, John Norris were classmates at Grinnell. Then, uh, finally, here I can say, two, two more things just to mention, and we'll stop and, and see what questions you have. Man, look, it's amazing. I got through this stuff in time for questions. I amaze myself if I can. Um, you remember the armband case in, in Des Moines? 
students who uh, over the Vietnam War wore armbands to school, and they were prohibited from doing that by, I think, the school board as well as the local administra as the administration of the school. And this was uh, went to trial in district court in 1966. Uh, it, the uh, uh, plaintiffs lost. And so it went to the U.S. Court of Appeals. It was a 4-4 split, so it finally went to the Supreme Court, where Abe Fortas wrote an opinion that supported the students' right to wear the armband. So what was the name of that family? It, the family was the Tinker family, Bethany and John Tinker and Christopher Eckhart were the, th were the three students. Well, Louise was the one who was driving this case. And, picked out Dan Johnson, the, the lawyer, a fairly young lawyer, who, who argued the case through all of the, the, courts, the courts. Joe was the one who financed it. So Louise, this is once when Louise got Joe on board, and Joe agreed, but Louise was, I mean, Joe didn't drive it, but uh, uh, Joe financed it. So he was intimately involved in that particular case. So that's, that's an important part. Then finally, I'll say this, and then we'll conclude. He, uh, invested heavily in the Boston Herald. So, I mean, he reached out. You know, and also, interestingly, and I, I'm going to find more about this, he invested in Broadway shows. Uh, so, you know, I don't think, Joe, Joe read the Wall Street Journal, uh, you know, and let, read the right things for him to read. He did, I don't think, I don't think it was a person who read books particularly. Uh, his intellectual interest didn't go in that, that direction. So it sort of surprised me when I thought he got interested in, in, in Broadway. Maybe he just saw it as a business opportunity, but that's one of those things I'd like to find more about. I've, I have evidence that he did invest, but I don't know in which shows and so on. So that, that, that's a sort of sketch of Joe's non-Grinnell life, which was very important. And you think that Grinnell College thinks of Joe as a savior, and, uh, but Planned Parenthood also feels that way about him. Without Joe, where would, where would they have been? And um, as I said to one of our um, representatives at one of these forums, um, <coughs> Warren Buffett feels as strongly about Planned Parenthood as Joe did. So maybe when they deprive uh, completely of public funds, well, would, would be an easy thing for Warren to step in. And, and, uh, so beware of what, what you do. You may get Planned Parenthood even better financed. I'm just guessing here. Well, would, Tommy. would that have been Louise's influence, his interest in Planned Parenthood? Um, Tommy's question is, uh, was Joe's interest in Planned Parenthood Louise's influence? Um, it, can't help, it can't help but have been an influence because Louise was probably the, almost the number one feminist in, in Iowa. Uh, notorious feminist, really. And you know, the, the Noun Archive which she was sort of interested in and wondered if Grinnell would, wanted it, but I, I was president and I said, it should be at Iowa, University of Iowa. It would be much better used at the University of Iowa than it would be Grinnell College. So I, I'm, maybe I you know, overlooked something important, but anyway, she was talking, she was creating the archive at that time. Um, it, it definitely, but, but there was so much sort of tension between them. There was a kind of tension. Uh, I think, I mean, there was, how, both, you think of Louise and Joe, they were so different in personality. Uh, Louise was hard-edged, in your face, uh, and Joe was not that at all. So their demeanor, their demeanor was very different, but they were a product of that same Rose, Frankel, Rosenfield, and Joe, of course, didn't have to push back against it, and Louise did, so she was, um, and that, I think, created part of the hard age. Louise, she had to fight for herself. Joe didn't have to fight for himself. I mean, everyone loved Joe. Uh, and it was just easy for Joe to open doors. I mean, he was a male, and, and all of these things. He didn't have the fights that Louise had. But Joe, uh, well, you know, I will shock you next time, because Joe uh, was the, uh, creator of a column in the SMB, the college newspaper, called Doric, a column of pure beauty. <laughs> and it was a humor column. And there's a running joke in there from one week to the next about the girl in my English class who always does dumb things. <laughs> <laughs>
So it's a very misogynist set of jokes. So, um, you know, as an undergraduate, as a kid, he was right in there with all the misogynists, at least if he could get a laugh from it. Uh, he was not that way when I knew him, or I think anybody, anyone in this room knew him. Uh, he was, and he was one of the ones pushing for women on the board of trustees and so on. Uh, so by the time he matured, and, and Yonkers had, they, Yonkers was the first department store to employ women. Guess what? When women were on the floor, their sales way outpaced the men. The people liked to go to a women cook, woman clerk. And the other stores and the, and, and the other employees at Yonkers got very jealous of the women, but they couldn't fight it. If you, if you got results, why well, you were going to have more women. So he, he comes from an environment that was pushing women, promoting women, and women were in, in pretty high. They were never they were never the CEO of Yonkers, but they were pretty high up. So he, there were a lot of influences I think that would push him in that direction. But surely Lee, Louis has had something to do with it. Arlen. Well. In your research, did you find any clues as what it is that creates such a generous personality? Um, I've always been marveled at the ability of some people to literally give themselves away. And I've often wondered, how does that happen? What, because you see so much of the opposite of that. And this is an indication of somebody who literally made the, made the vow to die broke. Yeah. And something happens in the upbringing of that, the college training, or whatever. I don't know, maybe you found some clues to that. Well, I think, and, and it's, a, it's a question that may have more answers by the time I finish in four, four weeks, but Arlen's question is, what was there in, in Joe's environment, in his uh, DNA or whatever, that made him so generous and, and uh, not, he, he was the least self-serving person I've ever known. Um, in fact, one of the one of the few negative comments you get is he could have been a better dresser. But then, as I got older, he didn't dress very well. And he comes from a clothing family. So. Um, I, I, it's you know the, the, the family thing. The, my mother very philanthropic, although I think she had a huge ego. Um, the Yonkers environment of uh, we give as well as we take. Uh, what is one of the things he said about Grinnell he, is after two weeks, you couldn't have driven me away with wild horses. I found something there that I really want. And one of the things he said is the other students. He, they were the kind of people he liked. So I think, you know, the, the Grinnell of um, Edward Steiner, uh, 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 you know, of uh, Macy and so on, and that was an environment that produced some uh, selfless people, I think. So I think I think Cornell can claim some credit. Um, but let, let, let us keep that in front and center as we go through these various lectures, because and and thought, think about Joe, because it's it's an assemblage of things that it, that influenced him. Okay, there. Were, uh, oh yeah, I think. Uh, given his uh, interest in. Uh, uh, financing Broadway plays, is there any connection with the founding of the Des Moines um, Civic Center? Now, the sixth question is Des Moines Civic Center founding. I could find none. Uh, the Crichton heirs who were Grinnell board members were key in that process. But I think Joe, Joe was not involved, deeply involved in that. The Marriott Hotel, which was John Ruan's big thing, he was only tangentially involved in that, but I've seen no, I and mean, I've asked that question about the Civic Center, and, and interestingly enough, I, I, there's no evidence that Joe was much involved. Well, he gave something, but uh, that he was really involved in that drive. Uh, one question more. And actually, yeah. if I'm allowed a quick comment, you touched on a, brought back a memory for me, and a really pleasant one. As a student, I was on that college board Yonkers, in Cedar Rapids. Ah. And at the same time, my mother was a buyer for many years at Yonkers in Cedar Rapids. When Al and I got married in 61, we had two years to finish, and I was teaching, and in the summers, I worked at Yonkers in Iowa City. So you brought back a lot of memories for me. Was, was it a good experience for Absolutely. you? Absolutely. Great place to work for. And my mother, if she were alive today, would say the same thing. Okay, Nancy Valley said that she was on the college board for the Cedar Rapids 
Yonkers store. Her mother worked for Yonkers, and, and Nancy worked the summer for Yonkers and found it, you know, as I described it, a, a remarkable environment. Thank you very much. Thank you, George. I know that you always enjoy having George give class. Uh, he has a unique style. George doesn't give lectures, George tells stories. <laughs> and thank you so much, George. And if you want to hear some more stories, we'll see you next Wednesday morning. Thank you for coming.